All right, everybody. If you can hear me, um, give me a thumbs up if you would. Beautiful. All right. Well, my name is Ryan Milburn. I am the chairman of RWDA. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning or good afternoon or depending on what part of the world you are. Good evening. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Today, we are honored to have uh, Robin from Canine Census doing her webinar today. Um, I'm going to cover just a couple things and then I'm going to turn it over to Robin. Um, first off, uh, just a couple things we got coming up. If you are going to be in the Las Vegas area uh, on March 12th, we still have a couple spots open for our live in person heavy explosives and fresh peroxides. We're going to have fresh TATP, fresh HMTD, among other things, as well as up to 400 pounds of a couple other odors. So um, if you're interested in attending that, please register on our website. Um, it is open only to uh, teams that we can vet that are either law enforcement or security. Uh, but give that a look. And then also, if you guys are interested in certificates of attendance for today's training uh just shoot us an email there at info at icrwda.org and i'm happy to get that out to you as far as today a couple rules uh number one please make sure your microphones are off so we're not interrupting robin as she does her thing uh questions absolutely we're open for questions uh just type them in the chat function and then at the end we'll be asking robin those questions there at the end uh, a little bit about Robin. She is absolutely a subject matter expert. Uh, here's just a little bit on the right. I'll let uh, Robin kind of explain a little bit more about her background. But uh, she started off in HRD canine work and then it really kind of rose to be the cream of the crop in the uh, search and rescue world. And she's definitely a kind person to uh, come and do this training for us today. So thank you, Robin. Uh, a couple things too, just. Uh, Please make sure and visit Robin's website at caninecensus.org. And then I'd also like to uh, thank our sponsor today, Protective Force International. So thank you, PFI. So with that, I'm going to lower my screen here and turn it over to Robin. Give me just a second. So um, I think, okay. I think um, Ryan covered everything that you needed to hear about logistics. And um, please, if you, you do have questions, hold them till the end. Um, hopefully I don't look quite that pixelated because I look pretty good down in the corner. But um, a little bit about me. If we go to the first, so uh, second slide, well, slide number four. Here's me, I'm trying to click on it, right? One more. There you go. This is my frame of reference. This is actually what I think about when I start thinking training outside the box, right? I'm thinking about um, disaster work. I'm a FEMA certified uh, search and rescue handler. I've been doing search work for almost, well, for 20 years. And this is actually my very first search dog on, at the Joplin tornado. So when we start thinking about having a box, um, I don't have a box because as a search and rescue dog handler, whether I'm doing wilderness search work or disaster search work, I never quite know what I'm going to end up doing when I get there. I responded to requests of local law enforcement so I'm working everything from um, homicide cases um, and clandestine grave. Uh, I have worked some prehistoric and historic graves. I've worked arson cases where we're looking for bodies in rubble. Um, I've, this was the Joplin tornado. You're gonna see a couple of slides later. And so if, when I think about my frame of reference, this is what I start thinking about, having a dog that is prepared to go into any sort of environment. Um, we'll flip to the next slide. I also have a dog that knows how to chill because most of us who have been on deployment anywhere know that there is a lot of downtime. 
So I, I've been, I've trained about 12 different dogs over the last 20 years, everything from border collies to labs. Um, Moses, who's right here is a lab mix, golden retriever, yellow lab mix. We happened to get lucky enough to find at the pound. Um, English shepherds, labs, which actually are currently my favorite. Um, and my current um, FEMA level dog is a Dutch Shepherd. And we expect our dogs to be able to do things like relax or do a five-story ho hoist, jump in a Chinook and fly wherever we might want them to go and be able to walk out of the plane or get to the top of the building and do their job, whether it's finding people dead or alive. So we also expect them, if you go to the next slide, to be able to work in absolute disasters or even work on water. So this is Ray, she's my retired FEMA search dog. Um, she. The top picture is actually us at the Moore, Oklahoma tornado. Um, we are currently clearing, in that particular picture, we're clearing the pad of a 7-Eleven where seven people died. Because most often as a FEMA handler, I am one of the last lines of defense through, possibly, before they send in the bulldozers. Now, things have come a long way since then. And it, it's, it's really nice to know that even before we picked up and left to go home, um, the, everybody was accounted for. Um, we also expect our cadaver dogs to be able to work on boats. So when I, I say that I expect my dogs to be able to work in all sorts of different areas, that's what I'm talking about. This dog can go from a disaster setting down to working on a boat or if you go to the next slide they can go from working a wide open wilderness area where you're going to have any sorts of live, uh, livestock or deer turkey whatever running through to doing vehicles alongside a busy road um, this is nico nico is my current fema certified dutch shepherd and um, one of his very first deployments, we got to do all sorts of hot onloads and offloads onto sandbars. Um, that was an interesting time. <clears throat> so when I started talking with Ryan about working with you guys, I was really trying to think about something that I could talk about that comes from my frame of reference which is training out, you know, training outside the box because I don't have a box. And um, moving to a place where um, I now train explosives and narcotics dogs. And I have found that a lot of the things that I teach my disaster dogs are also really, really beneficial in the narcotics and explosives or the finer detection dog, more finesse detection dog sports or detection dog uh, profession and so I started thinking about if you flip to the next slide what a versatile dog is because in my mind that is what I'm doing I train outside the box so that a dog is versatile and in all of this it came down to a couple of things. I need a dog that is resilient, that can look at an area and be able to recover from anything that might be going on in that area. They will persevere to find their odor, to get their bad guy, all of those things, and they will consistently offer the train final wrong response behavior or they will consistently offer that out that we need to them at the end of the bite in order to be able to do their job well. Because in essence, flip to the next slide, 
This is the environment that I ask my dog to work in. This is an ice flow. So whatever you think looks like a boulder in this particular picture is actually a large chunk of ice. And I asked my 15 month old Dutch Shepherd to do hot onloads and offloads out of a helicopter onto sandbanks that by the way, the helicopter couldn't actually land on because it turns out that that was too much weight and they would start to sink to go search um, a portion of a three mile ice block flow that had broken through a dam to uh, search for a missing man. This is not something that you, you know, you get up thinking that you're going to train for that day, right? So when we start thinking of a resilient, consistent dog that perseveres, we start very, very small. Um, um, these are two of my lab puppies. And if I start working on my foundational behaviors, Everywhere that I can think of, if my lab puppy can do their train final response on a metal grate or in a chicken coop in front of with 60 chickens standing behind them, I really think that they can do it anywhere. So this is when we start talking about generalizing all of that behavior at a very foundational level as fast as you can. So one of the things I'll start challenging you guys to think about is, and, and search dog handlers do this all the time. I don't care where I'm driving to this day. If I could be driving three states away, I don't even have a dog in the car and I can see a crush pile off to the side of the road and I immediately flip into a whole analysis of, oh my gosh, that would be a fantastic spot to train. There's a slash pile right next to it. My dog has never seen a slash pile. For FEMA level work, we actually have to go through a two-stage certification process. We have a fundamental skills assessment that is um, a whole bunch of components put together with the very last piece being a search on a rubble pile but it allows us to do a whole bunch of training on all sorts of different things. If my dog can get out and in any location do a vehicle search on a horse trailer or a stock trailer that's full of cattle, oh boy, can they sure get out and do a vehicle search with a whole bunch of people on their way to an NBA game. If I can take my dog to a livestock auction, auction and have them search all of the vehicles outside a livestock auction, they can sure do the parking lot of my casino or a horse show. Now, you, then you start getting into, oh my gosh, there's horses and horse people get a little crazy about dogs around their horses, but that's okay. So I start teaching at a very, very young age, all three of these components. So we're going to put some constructs on these for, for the, the people in the room, right? Perseverance is something that we start teach. We can teach at a very young age. You know, you're most of you, I'm going to assume, right? Because I might get this wrong, but I don't know, end up getting a green dog. And so some of this stuff, because I have always taken dogs from puppies, I can help craft all of their experiences that they interact with the entire planet 99% of the time. If you're getting green dogs, some of this is you're going to have to think about, well, I don't know where this dog has been. I don't know what experience this dogs have. So let's start teaching these things. Now, here's something I'll tell you. Climbing ladders in no way, shape, or form actually teaches my dog to do odor work better. But what it does do is it gives him tenacity and it gives him grit and it gives him confidence and it gives him an understanding of where his hind feet are 
so that when I ask him to go do odor work on a rubble pile, some of these things can operate in the background and I don't have to worry about him trying to figure it out while he's doing his odor work. So I think about breaking all of these things down into individual skill sets so that our dogs can work through them. If you flip to the next slide, resilience and perseverance is also, I can work a couple of them at the same time. I need you to be resilient. This particular collage of photos is Dash, who is currently my explosives detection dog. Um, upper right is the first weekend that I brought him home. That was, we actually went to a disaster dog training. He learned how to do tunnels. He learned how to climb through dark boxes. He learned to do all sorts of things. He also spent a little bit of time on the rubble pile, um, which is him on the top right. A year later, he's walking across the rubble pile, pile with no fear whatsoever because not only have I spent the time with him to figure out where all four feet are, but he'll also do obedience for me at a distance on the pile. As an explosives detection dog, do I ever need him to find explosives on a rubble pile? Oh no, probably not but I can ask him to do it and he will. And I also know that when I take him into a new location, anywhere, anytime, he has the confidence and resiliency to be able to do that. And so if we go to the next slide, nothing, I, all of these slides are actually about agility. Agility is something that you can absolutely, on a daily basis, work with your dog. It increases their physical stamina. It makes their brain tired. Yay us, right? And it really, really helps with them um, being able to recover and bounce back. One of the most interesting things was, this was Ruby. This is a dog I bought as a green dog. Um, she, she was, Tip, no obedience work, very little obedience work, very little agility, and teaching her that she had four feet, I went from a dog that was very, very um, disengaged to a dog that would run across a rubble pile looking for dead people and bark for me. And we spent a lot of time working on agility types of items because it allows us, allowed me to be able to move her where I needed her to be um, and then be able to respond to doing all of the different cadaver um, searches that I might ask her to do later. And I also need a dog that is going to be consistent in their behavior, if you'd advance to the next slide. And the reason that this is really important is because every single one of us wants to know the dog that we're getting out of the car when we go to work. Because if you don't know that that dog is going to be completely consistent in I find odor, I do my train final response, I'm not gonna spook out, I'm not gonna do all these things, we need fluent behaviors out of our dogs. We are taking a sentient being that doesn't speak our language, asking them to work for an extended period of time, sometimes out of sight, all for the equivalent of engagement with a $15 toy or for a piece of food. So really thinking about all of those skill sets that you can actually put together helps us truly create a versatile dog. And I, I've shown this picture to a lot of people. They're like, what does having your dog do agility next to a donkey have to do? Because that's actually where my uh, FEMA level agility field is, is in with my donkeys and goats, because then I don't have to mow it. Um, and the answer is, if I can have my dogs 
doing agility work with goats, chickens, and miniature donkeys running around, and they are still actively engaged in what I want them to do, that will translate nicely over when we go to a casino floor with the circus coming through, when I go to the amusement park that I do contract work in, and I've got the man on stilts walking by and children running and screaming, and my dog doesn't even bat an eye because you know what? They look a lot like little tiny donkeys or goats running around doing really weird random things. So it allows me to build, uh, next slide please, that versatile dog. So in order to think about all of these things as you start putting to them together, next slide, we're gonna think in skill sets. <clears throat> and because otherwise it turns into this big, huge problem and I'm gonna give you a specific tool that you can actually, two of them, um, a specific tool that you can use to help yourself start training a little bit outside the box. Because all of us, even though we try really, really hard, we have patterns. We always hide three training aids. We always tend to hide the same aids because they might be in a box that we like better. It's easier to get stuff out. We always go to the same spot. One of the things that I've, um, I've noticed, because when I do contract work, you know, you do 100 cars in a night, or I go to the same amusement park and I work the same route. I have a pattern because I figured out what my pattern is when I work that whole entire route. How do I actively keep my dog engaged in their job and not only my dog, but me? because part of being in that world is also being uh, situationally aware. So we're gonna think a little bit about skill sets. So next slide, please. There is an app out there called Tiny Decisions. And this is one of the things that I have started using to help myself think about training outside the box. So you can go in and with the free version, um, this, this happens to be a partially, uh, I'm gonna show you some of what I do when I start thinking, one, I can't come up with a good idea for training that day, or um, I only have so much time to really plan out something really cool, or it's 40 below and I don't wanna go outside and train. So um, I, can, I can actually pull this up and say, okay, I'm at a loss, what are we gonna do today? And I can hit that little center button and I filled out all of the little things on this particular wheel. I hit this little button and it spins around and it says, oh look, today you're gonna do impulse control. And I'm like, okay, impulse control. Next slide, please. This is impulse control in my world for my Dutch Shepherd. He has to run out to a certain location and he has to stay there and wait as I drive around in our little UTV because he would really, really, really like to bite the tires. And when he is quiet and he is waiting, calmly, no barking, no whining, nothing, then I release him and I use a flat out sprint of us, I've clocked him at about 22 miles an hour. That's one of his most favorite things in the world is that's the reinforcer, is actually him um, being able to run at Mach 2 in front of the mule. So I, I have things on there like Pilates. Um, I actually have all the little, um, uh, fit bone and fit pause things that you can use. Um, directionals, I use a lot of directionals in my work. Um, this particular location for him to go sit and wait is about 75 feet 
or about 75 feet from where I usually start him, I send him out to that location. He's got to sit there until I drive by, or I will redirect him to other places on our farm, and he waits for me to come. Um, some of my dogs do laser directionals. I will probably never use laser directionals in anything that I get deployed for. But it is a great directional skill that I can use for my dogs. It gives us something to work on in the winter when I don't want to go outside. Or if I am really trying to balance out, I, had, I did odor work yesterday, I did obedience one day, let's do laser directionals. It actually takes a lot of impulse control. It's also stimulus control of, I've told you to follow this laser. When you get to the laser, you sit and you wait for your next cue. So I use all of those. Obedience at a distance, that's a safety issue for, for me and what I do and for the labs, right? Um, we do a lot of healing. Public access work, I am fortunate enough depending on what country you're in, right? To be able, I can put my dogs in working dog vests and take them shopping. It makes it very exhausting for me, but sometimes they think it's fantastic. It helps with the impulse control, especially for my Dutch, to be able to go shopping in Walmart and have all of those other things go around. It's a great skill set for him to have. Go to the next slide. You can also combine all of them. In this particular example, this is at the water park that we work. And I can combine agility, directionals, and odor work all into one combination. Meaning I stand in the spot where you see me right now and I direct my dog to whichever platform I want to them to go to and I ask them to search in that particular location. Sometimes you have to be a little imaginative and finding those fun things that you can do um, and actively look for new places to train. If we go to the next slide, start, so we have the skills, the, the graphic of um, being resilient or a versatile dog and then you overlay that with the search, locate, and report framework. I first heard this um, 18 years ago at a seminar with Steve White when he talked about what the search, search that's what your search chain is, search, locate, report. And within every single one of these little compartments, there are things specifically that you can work on. If you go to the next slide, I've combined a little bit of my um, cadaver dog world with my um, narcotics and explosives world. So sometimes my explosives and um, narcotics dogs are expected to do rubble searches or they're expected to do water searches. Um, the use of the TADS has really, really opened up what I can do with those two dogs because then I'm not worried about my training material getting wet. Um, but I can say, okay, what type of search am I doing today? You can actually, in this Tiny Decisions app, you can actually also weight them. So if you say, okay, I'm, I'm really need to work on orts, but I want to be able to have everything up. I can have the ort category be a little bit bigger. So it will say, nope, that's what you're working on today. Okay. So this is the type of search that I'm doing. I can also make the decision, am I working on leader off leash in all of these decisions? I have the tendency because of my history, I work off leash a lot. Um, I have found that people don't really like that when you're working in an amusement park, so we work on leash. Um, and then there's also a difference between working on a six foot static lead versus a flexi lead. Um, are your dogs used to the constant pressure that goes on with being on a flexi lead? 
So those types of things can also be a whole nother circle. So that's your search circle. So next slide, please. Then we go to what odor? Go back one. Um, what odor? You can put all of your odors in here. And it can, it can give you an idea of what you might want to actually be searching, you know, which odors so that you can keep track and um, in your training logs. Next slide, please. When I start thinking about my locate criteria, I'm asking, is it located low? Is it located high? Is it a shallow constant, a shallow odor, so meaning concentrated? Can they almost put their nose on it? Or is it deep and diffuse? Meaning that it's all the way at the back of the drawer or hidden way deep in a car. Is it, um, when I say in, out, and in, um, is it actually um, the dog is in odor, and it goes out of odor, and has to get back into odor? I start thinking about my um, scent theory and teaching my dogs all about scent theory in this locate portion of their training so that I can very systematically walk them through in my progression what I want you to know. Now, some of these advanced skills that we're talking about very much assume that your dog has a really, really solid trained final response. And next slide. Um, last month, when Jeff was talking, he popped up um, this this really interesting um, dis delineation between distractions and diversions and so I have borrowed it and um, I start adding distractions as quickly as possible into my dog's training because I need them to understand that the stimuli I want them responding to is actually the stimuli of odor it is not anything else. And as fast as I can get them to understand that, and as many different locations as I can get them to understand it, it's fantastic. Um, so distractions can be anything that's obvious, right? Um, I start thinking about things like popcorn, um, food that the random child has left laying around wherever, or um, even the things that are part of the background noise, heavy equipment, um, things of that nature. Diversions are distractions with intent. Um, one of the uh, best things that I have seen happen, especially to your detection dogs, is if you take something specific, like for say a baked potato, and you put a baked potato out in the middle of a hay barn or a cattle barn because your dog's never seen that before. Why is there a baked potato out in the middle of my cattle barn? It really helps you figure out, is your dog an anomaly detector or is it an odor detector? And so that's what those place diversions actually are is, and I want my dogs to be actually thinking about, well, no, that's not odor. I only get reinforced for being at odor. So if we go to the, the next slide, is my trained final response. And I spend, a, I, this is where I spend a lot of time teaching because um, dogs naturally know how to search and locate something. This report behavior, the trained final response, in most things tends to be the thing that falls apart um, that I've seen in certifications. And um, when put under stress, the dog's like, well, I found it, uh, but no, I'm not gonna tell you about it. And so I have dissected down to, am I 
doing things like working on latency, how fast when my dog recognizes odor, does it um, begin its trained final response? How speed is how fast it completes that trained final response. Duration is how long it has to hold that um, trained final response behavior. And then I have durations with distractions. So that means, um, can they hold it while um, popcorn sitting on the floor? Or diversions. You have all sorts of other things going on. Now, when you start taking this out into the world of, oh my gosh, I need my dog to search past and ignore the 15 deer that have just run by, or the fact that it's on the top of a rubble pile and my dog is supposed to bark and they can't, they have to self-balance because whatever that they're standing on is wobbly and they have to bark. This actually becomes somewhat of an issue if you haven't taught them to do it ahead of time. So one of the things you could absolutely do is teach, take your dog and have them understand that they have to be able to sit down or stand or whatever their trained final response is on an unstable surface. That may happen, at least in my world, it happens all the time. So um, you can also take all of these interesting things um, next slide and put them on a unique surface. It's interesting. Think about where you place your training aids. These are big round hay bales. This is what we use to feed the cows. Um, my explosives and narcotics dogs strongly believe that there are narcotics and explosives hidden in big round bales because it actually allows me the opportunity to be able to create very unique scent problems um, that they then have to learn how to work out so that hopefully by time I actually get around to um, working, um, walking up and thoroughly sniffing a trash can is not a big deal because I've also worked past the three stray cats, the skunk and um, whatever dead critter is laying off to the side. So um, I, I have all sorts of examples I can continue to give you about how we have 700 acres and 150 cows so uh, and goats and miniature donkeys and chickens. Um, so uh, I could be giving you all sorts of examples, but um, in general, I want you to really think about drive around, look at what are those unique um, training opportunities can give you. Um, start thinking about all of the additional skill sets that you may need to have with your dog. And then if you go to the last slide, um, do I expect my dogs to be able to, um, on a deployment, ride in a car next to a bunch of chickens? No. But it's really helpful when I'm going to go train and I'm dropping chickens off at the local high school because they bought some um, to have my 12 week old puppy understand that riding quietly in the car next to me and a bunch of chickens is highly desirable. So um, this is where you can find me, um, caninecensus.org. Um, Canine Census is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, I have a trainers group associated with Canine Census that um, I, I, I post things in and it is, um, I'm also a internationally, International um, Coaching Federation certified coach. So uh, we tend to do a lot of business stuff um, as well. So um, I, I guess I'm open for questions. All right, let me, Sorry, because I was doing the other stuff. Um, let me catch up on any questions. Let's see here. Uh, well, the first question is, will this be available as a recording? Yes, it will. It'll be available on the uh, ICR WDA private Facebook group, and that's free to join. Just answer the admin questions and you're welcome to join us. Um, 
Hannah Davis says the trainers forum on Facebook is great. And it says for the distractor, baked potato out in the middle of the barn. If the dog checks the potato because it doesn't belong, but continues on clearing areas, is this excess acceptable? Absolutely. Or are you saying the dog should not respond to the potato at all? So there is a difference between checking it out and a difference between doing their trained final response. I have no problem if the dog checks it out, they should not give me their trained final response. The only reason they should do their trained final response is if target over odor is present. Excellent. Uh, Casey asked, how do you edit the training wheel in tiny decisions? Um, if you pull up tiny decisions and, um, I have it on my phone, so I have to look, right? Tiny mm -hmm. decisions. Um, if you hit the three little lines, upper right corner, um, it'll pop up all the different options you have. You can hit the plus sign to create a new wheel, or you can hit the pencil to edit that particular one. All right. Uh, Jordan Gonzalez at, is asking, how would you work on agility with odor without having access to any specific equipment? Ladders are fantastic. Um, I would end up, you could, if you have access to ladders, tires, barrels, or lumber of any sort, you can build an agility pile. Out on the Canine Census website under Programs and Services, I believe, is a link to um, agility plans and inspiration. And we actually have a whole set of plans for agility equipment. We also have a whole set of pictures on a Google Drive that you can go look at. Um, when I start thinking of adding agility and odor work together, what I showed you examples of are operational level dog. Um, I start with things as simple as, can my dog walk across pallets and have odor hidden at the bottom of a pallet or underneath the pallet? because the dog has to think about where all four feet are as it walks across the pallet. Unless you, and keep in mind, when I start thinking about agility, I don't want my dogs running at 500 miles an hour. I'm not doing AKC competition of um, agility. I'm actually doing very slow, methodical thinking dogs because I don't want them hurt. Um, you can actually put all of those, um, if, if you're thinking about agility and combining it with things, um, go to your local uh, playground. That's a great place to start agility. That's where I start a lot of my puppies in agility is we go to the local playground and we get, learn to walk on grates. We learn to walk on all sorts of things. Um, and you can hide your odors, especially if you have um, the precision explosives odors that have the magnets on them. Pop those right underneath the agility equipment and then the dog's walking over them and sniffing down. Excellent. I, I have to say, I'm definitely going to add a potato in my training tomorrow. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Robert. You're welcome. Um, anyone else have any questions? Or if I missed questions, uh, please feel free to type them in again if I missed some. I think that might be it. But Robin, truly, thank you. Um, oh, it says, are there certain breeds used for, that you prefer using for canine training? Um, I am at, at heart. A border collie person however most border collies are um, more smart than their handler <laughs> so I have a pet border collie I know what you mean yeah so um, it totally really depends on the job that you're doing 
Um, no Labrador, unless you're really, really lucky, is going to be able to do dual purpose work. Um, however, if I like labs because they're incredibly forgiving. If um, you are training and selling dogs or you have dogs who are going to be um, have to get used to a lot of handlers, having a lab or a dog that is more forgiving and will just kind of do their thing is nice. Now, um, having a Dutch Shepherd that I've trained to do FEMA level work, um, his work ethic is amazingly awesome. However, he has the unwritten rule that if you reinforce me for doing the behavior like this once, that is written in stone. And so I have to be very, very careful how I set that up and sometimes transitioning that from handler to handler to handler can be very, very difficult. So my preferred breeds for general detection work are um, actually, I like labs and the Dutch Shepherd Malinois from the, the KNPV lines. Excellent. And kind of on the same line of, of thinking there, how do you deal with those super high energy dogs on the agility stuff when you put a ladder out and the dog wants to go up the ladder, but he's crashing through it. He's knocking it over. Um, just that super high drive. How do you kind of dial that back for them to learn on the agility courses? Um, all my ladders start flat um, because we have to teach you have four feet. Um, cheese whiz is awesome. Or the squeezy cheese that comes out of the little um, container that you can put right on the rung so that they walk on the rungs and lick the cheese off of every rung. You can also do that with peanut butter. Um, I also have created, Nico was very uh, difficult at this because he very much ran in two wheel drive and the, the end just followed along. And he always has the mentality, if I just run faster, I'll get through it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually had to teach him outside of his ladder work a weight. So if he could be, he can be walking or um, running and I can say wait and he'll stop and he'll stand. And gotcha. right, you can also teach them a slow, e actually I use it as easy, which means go a little slower. And as you start, the, the ladder that I have built is just made out of two by four. So it's got two by four sides, um, a rung that's a one by one across it. And then I have started, I start with it looking almost solid because it's got two by fours laid flat. Mm -hmm. And then I start removing two by fours at infrequent, um, places so the dog has to very quickly learn well I can run across it as a trot when it's solid but as soon as it gets I start removing two by fours then I have to think about where I put my feet at the same time I'm teaching them a turn on a um, really wide plank so that they have to they walk out because that's one of our requirements for FEMA is as we all the dog, the dogs have to precede us over every single obstacle. And at some point on one of those obstacles, we have to do a turn. So on a verbal cue, the dog has to turn around, face us. And then we say, continue on the way you were going. They turn back around and walk away from us and jump off the obstacle. Wow. Yeah. So um, I, I teach all of that at the same time so that the dog learns. I don't quite know when a cue is going to come. So the slower and more cautiously I do this, the better. And cheese sticks. Gotcha. So I have to share my potatoes, cheese whiz, and cheese sticks. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> 
Uh, Casey asked, um, how often do your uh, star dogs or FEMA dogs have to research? Is it annually or is it every couple years? So for FEMA, we are recertifying every three years. For your cadaver dogs, your wilderness cadaver dogs, it's annually. That's actually industry standard. Um, your area search dogs are maybe every other year. It kind of depends. 99.9% um, of the wilderness search and rescue handlers in the United States are volunteers who are in charge of their own education. So. Um, I have never been to a formal dog training school. Uh, the closest I've ever been is uh, three weeks of uh, chicken workshops with Parveen Farhoudi. Wow, all right. Excellent, I think, uh, let me check my phone because I got a bunch in my phone. Nope, I think we covered them all. Well, I think that's it. Um, again, Robin, truly, thank you so much for joining us today and oh. sharing your world with uh, our handlers and trainers. I greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, and for anyone else that's watching, we will be posting the video in the ICR WDA uh, private Facebook group. Uh, usually it takes me about three or four days to get that up, but it will be there. So again, thank you all for joining us today and everybody have a great night. Yeah.